after leaving uh, Manus in Kyrgyzstan, uh, we flew down to Kandahar Airfield. And we stayed in Kandahar for a couple of days, you know, all the in-processing stuff that, that you got to do. Yeah. Um, but then they sent us up to Zabul province, a uh, small fob called uh, Fob Logman in Zabul province. What had you been told? I mean, by this time, the conflict in Afghanistan has been going on for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, looking back on that, so far as you can, you know, piece together what was going through your mind, you know, what was the state of play in Afghanistan at the time in 2011? It was a pretty interesting dynamic, you know, because just as you had said, we we had already been there for 10 years, right? We're, we're, we're coming up on year, you know, 11 at that time. And so there really was kind of a, a, a sense of almost permanence, if that makes sense. Hmm. Like we knew we were going to still be there for a while. Yeah. And so we were trying to create more sustainable operations throughout the area. Um, but at the same time, we also knew this was also uh, kind of the beginnings of the drawdown. Uh, you know, President really? Obama, 2011-2012 uh, was when we started to uh, draw down our forces throughout Afghanistan. So it was a really interesting dynamic because we we were talking about the drawdowns and what that could look like. But we were also trying to create a more sustainable operation. So it was... It was an interesting dynamic. Well, it was, and, it was and, a bit confusing at times. Well, yeah. As soon as you say that, I'm wondering, you know, how does that, how does that work? And um, I mean, since we're here, I mean, yeah, is that psychologically possible? If one side of your brain is saying, "Hey, we're we're in the process, we're talking about being in the process of pulling out," mm -hmm. and then the other, you know, the other voice is saying, "And we need to." stabilize the situation if that's the right way of putting it i mean yeah. how did that how did that actually work out on the ground you know overall i i think it worked well because the way that we approached it was where are going to be the most strategic places for us to be right if we are going to draw down obviously we're not going to be able to uh you know to man all of the fobs that we had been up to that point so we were starting to look at more strategic locations of, of where we needed to be to help stabilize the situation so that we could then look towards the future of what does exiting the country look like. And so it, it just shifted our focus a bit more from, uh, you know, how do we man all of these different fobs? What are our operations going to look like out of each and every one of these fobs to, okay, which ones are the most strategically important to us? And let's pour our focus into that so that we can then hopefully stabilize the situation. Now, when, so when we're talking about these, these FOBs, these forward operating bases, and where should we place them strategically, is part of that about, um, you know, responding to Taliban, for lack of a better phrase, Taliban types, you know, who... Yeah who are fighting with you or who need to be dealt with one or another, is that also partly um, meant to bolster psychologically and in terms of materiel, the Afghan forces themselves? So the Afghan forces say, well, we're here, it's our country, but there are Americans and other NATO forces in these FOBs that can help us if we need help. Was that part of it as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things by the time I got into country, something that they had been doing for uh, quite a while, I, I couldn't give you a time frame, but, but for quite some time they had been, um, integrating, you know, our Afghan counterparts with U.S. forces, um, in such a way where half of the FOB would be U.S. forces, the other half would be, you know, either the Afghan National Police or Afghan National Army. Um, and any time we went out, you know, outside the wire, we would always take some of our Afghan counterparts with us so that they could see what 
uh, patrol operations looked like, you know, peacekeeping operations, things like that. So we were pretty heavily integrated with our, our Afghan counterparts uh, throughout my entire time there. So I want to jump ahead then. When the time of the final pullout comes, mm -hmm. what we discover pretty quickly is that the Afghan forces weren't weren't ready to take yeah. control of their country. I'm not asking you to explain that because I think that would be the subject of a of a lot of books. But sure. was that surprising to you based on what you saw in your year? So it was, you know, I, I think a lot of folks initially thought that this was going to be somewhere that we ended up just having some sort of kind of almost like our next uh, South Korea, right? Where we end up putting, mm -hmm. you know, bases and, and and we have a garrison unit there. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people were expecting that. And so it was surprising, but at the same time, you know, this was a war that could buy its own drink just about, right? It could buy its own glass of whiskey. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think at some point you had to, make that decision on whether or not we're going to pull out. We've done everything that we can, you know, 20 mm -hmm. years, um, you know, is that long enough? Um, so it, it was, it wasn't, it was a little surprising to you that we did pull out completely. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm interpreting a little bit here, you know, given cool. all of the investment of the, you know, the previous 20 years. Yeah. Was it a surprise to you? That the that the Taliban basically took control again as quickly as it did, at least of Kabul, which you know in in one sense means the country. Yeah, no, absolutely, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, it 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 was surprising. It really was, especially that it happened so quickly. I mean, just within weeks of our exit, they had regained control of of a good portion of, of the country. But at the same time, you know, I had the opportunity to work um, pretty closely for a few months with, with some of our Afghan uh, national police. Um, and, you know, you could see their struggles. You could see their struggles in terms of command and control. Um, it was very difficult to get some of these large groups of folks to come together and unite under one ideal or, or under president Karzai, however you want to look at it, because what, what a lot of people don't understand about Afghanistan is that it's a very tribal country, you know, mm -hmm. very tribal. And so, whereas we in the U S we tend to feel, you know, great loyalty to, to the country, uh, to the concept of what the United States of America is, um, in Afghanistan, they're more concerned with their tribe um, for the betterment of, of their family, their tribe, not necessarily the concept of, of an entire country. And so while it was surprising, you know, the the signs were there that pointed to this was a possibility, if that we're, makes sense. We're using the phrase nation building. You know, which we understand because yeah. we understand the concept of a nation. Yeah. I, I'm hearing it from you and I've heard it from others who are in Afghanistan. That culture or the cultures that exist in that country just didn't operate with the conception of a nation, right? It was more the conception of my my group, my region, my language. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Did this kind of thing occur to you during your year in Afghanistan? You know, you would, you know, you'd hear these terms like nation building, and then you'd, you know, look around and say, but that's not how these folks think. I mean, mm -hmm. did that ever, did that ever, did that go, is this something that sort of occurred to you afterwards or, or did it pass through your mind at the time? Oh, we, we, it was absolutely on our radar the entire time we were there. Absolutely. You know, I mean, just from having conversations with, um, you know, folks that live in the South, um, also known as, you know, Pashtuns, hearing them talk and then hearing some of the folks up North uh, as they would speak, 
you know, you could hear it in, in the way they spoke, the words that they chose to use. Um, you could hear it, you know, it wasn't necessarily about what's for the, for the good of, of Af Afghanistan or the people of Afghanistan. Um, a lot of the conversations that I had with folks, you know, they would talk about what's, what's good for their tribe or what's good for their family. Um, wow. and so the, you know, the signs were there and, and, and I had quite a few talks with some of my, you know, my, uh, my colleagues and, and my leadership on, you know, what does this look like when we do eventually leave? Because before we got there, there was tribal infighting. Um, and when we left that, we saw that tribal infighting come right back into it. And I feel like that that's kind of what played into the Taliban being able to take over so quickly after we left was the fact that we had a lot of uh, disjointed or or tribal type rules, but then the Taliban under a united front were able to come in and 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 take that over. Do you remember the first or one of the first things you saw that really drove the point home to you that this is a radically different society? You know, I think for me, the first thing that really stuck out to me was it, it was about three days after I got into country. Um, myself and my platoon sergeant got sent to um it was in afghan national police and afghan national army compound uh right in the middle of the city so we were in a city called um kalat city mm -hmm. um and when we entered that compound and we saw how all of the ana and amp um you know were living we had a small little section of that um of that compound that, that was, you know, for us, um, just seeing how differently they lived and the fact that, uh, several of the buildings, even though they had been there for, for years, they didn't have, you know, electricity or, or, uh, full electricity, I should say, you know, certain hours of the day. Um, you know, when you, when you walk in there and you see that folks are, um, you know, they're, they're hanging their clothes out to the, to dry. They're washing them, you know, in buckets with, with washboards, you know, that's kind of the first notion I had that, okay, we're, we're in a pretty different, you know, world because when, when those first couple of days on, on the fob, you know, we have running water, we have electricity, we have you know, washing machines, things like that. Um, but then, you know, you just go down the road a little bit and you have intermittent electricity, you have, uh, you don't really have running water, um, things like that. So that's, you know, just those few days uh, after I got in country and, and witnessed that, or when I first showed up to that compound, that's when it kind of hit me that, okay, yeah, we're, we're in a, we're in a different situation here. Yeah. People who live in a perpetual state of hardship, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, or what, what we would consider hardship anyways, consider, you know? Yeah, sure. You know? Yeah, and therefore, who probably, and, you know, let me know what you think, but therefore, who probably don't have a whole lot of mental energy to contemplate concepts like a nation, democracy, um, equality. I, I mean, do you think that's, do you think that's fair, just sort of this basic human reality that if someone's living very close you know, the, the things that are most pressing on them day after day are really the most basic questions of life, you know, it's getting through oh, yeah. day by day. There's just not a lot of psychological energy for things that Canadians, for example, would take for granted, you know, uh, sort of big questions about political philosophy and things like that. Do you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, when you look at it from that psychological standpoint, and, and not to get on a tangent, but when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, we have to have that 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 safety, that shelter, all of that things before we can get to the point of self-actualization. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that's where kind of the concept of nation building comes from, is that self-actualization piece. And so if you're spending mm -hmm. most of your physical and mental energy just to make sure that you have clean water, just to make sure that you have uh, what you need to, to feed your family, then it doesn't allow that room or that that space to contemplate those those larger uh, 
philosophical, if you will, sure. uh, ideations. It just doesn't it doesn't leave room for it. So I guess that would be then the rationale for a lot of the nation building stuff right? and the hearts and minds stuff. That would be the rationale for the hearts and minds stuff, right? Yeah. Bring medical yeah. care, help with the schools, bring school supplies to, I guess that would be the rationale to take care of those basic needs so that then we can have these other discussions. U.S. forces were preceded in Afghanistan by the Soviets. And I'm just curious, when in your year there, did you see signs of the Soviet presence back in the, back in the, at the end of the 70s and the 80s? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you, you could, uh, we could see signs of when Alexander the Great tried to conquer Afghanistan. Um, you know, where I was, where I was, uh, the fob I was at in Zabul province, we were actually just a few miles away from Alexander the Great's uh, castle that he built. Um, of course, I never got the opportunity to visit it, unfortunately, yeah. but there were remnants all over, um, you know, from the weapons and the tools that, that the locals yeah. used. Uh, a yeah. lot of those were old Soviet weapons that, that they held on to. Um, there were still, people still loved talking about the Mujahideen. Mm. They love talking about the Mujahideen. Oh boy. Um, and in my job, you know, I, I did a lot of, of, of interrogations and, and things like that. Uh, they loved watching uh, Rambo, the, the one where he goes and saves Afghanistan. I can't tell you how many times I've watched that movie. Uh, because no, um... it was was this, I mean, you know, from your perspective as a soldier, I'm guessing that that must have been a little arresting to see these relics of other great powers that had come into Afghanistan and and hadn't, and it just hadn't worked out. I mean, was it, or was that just something that just went by you and you didn't think about it till later? Oh, no, absolutely. We, we, we thought about it. We, we talked about it. Um, you know, it, it, it is a bit alarming to enter a country you know they, they i've heard several people you know several afghans um several members of, of the afghan government uh, refer to their own country the graveyard of empires hmm. um and you know they know that and they hold on to that that's a point of pride for for all of them is is look at how many empires have come here to die um wow and it's it's a point of pride for for a lot of them yeah, whatever else you want to say, I mean, just making a general statement, these are some remarkably tenacious people, huh? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I think, I think that, I mean, you know, per personal opinion here, I think part of the reason that we were there for so long is because I think we, we, we underestimated them as, as a group of people mm. uh, and their, their tenacity. Um, and so I think that I think that's what mm. it, at least played a part into why we were there. So their creativity, again, is something I think that we underestimated their ability to. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. I have never seen anybody who's been able to build, uh, you know, an improvised explosive device out of uh, a cell phone and a jug full of fertilizer. Uh, I mean, you know, they, they they can take the parts from a couple of, you know, cheap cell phones like the old Nokia bricks we used to have back in the, you know, early 2000s. They'll take those and some uh, fertilizer and they'll make some of the most devastating improvised explosive devices that I've ever seen. Wow. And did you see a lot of them? I, I saw a few. Yeah, I saw a few. And I mean, just seeing their their tenacity and their ability. I mean, they could take just about anything and, and turn it into um, a weapon if they needed to. What was the first thing you experienced that drove home the point to you that you were in a war zone? You You know that when you're going in. But it's an abstraction until you see something, hear something, experience something that really drives the point home. And now it's no longer no longer an abstraction. Now you know for sure. Do you, yeah. do you recall what that was? Yeah. You know, and and 
up to this point, there had been a couple of, of things that had happened, you know, uh, some of the first nights that we were on Kandahar airfield doing our in-processing, you know, the, the alarms go off and we're, we're getting indirect fire, but none of those actually ever hit the base. I didn't even see them. The alarms just went off. But the first time that it really hit home to me that I was in a war zone, this, this could, um, you know, the conditions were right where if, if something went wrong, I could not be going home, right? The first moment that I truly felt that was a couple of weeks in, I was at that same um, ANA and ANP compound um, when there were some of the first uh, insider attacks against U.S. troops uh, mm-hmm. by uh, Afghan forces or what they call the uh, and so I was sitting there I was helping um, some of our Afghan counterparts just with battle tracking right you know where are our troop movements where are your troops where are enemy troops you know just just basic battle tracking yeah uh, when we got the call from Fob Eagle which was just a little ways away from us uh that two us uh two us soldiers were were killed by afghan forces and fled wow um, and that's when it really hit me that that i was in a dangerous place i was i was in a war zone what impact did that have on you i mean there's the shock but did it did that change how you looked at things sort of the way you conducted yourself how you interacted with Af- afghan allies i was definitely more reserved um after that there you know there there was a the small group that i worked with directly at that at that compound um i still you know worked very closely with uh, we still had great conversations um but everybody else in that compound and and other afghan forces that i would come in contact with after that uh i definitely stayed a bit more reserved and and hung back i definitely had to sharpen my situational awareness after that um you know so i kept my distance i made sure to keep an eye um or a closer eye anyways on on the afghan forces specifically um but but also just my my surroundings in general how how long had you been in country when this happened? Um, I mean, maybe, may, maybe a month. And you have how many to go? Eleven months to go? Uh, yeah, yeah. You've kind of indicated the soldiers sit around and talk and sort of process things. Um, I'm assuming that this becomes part of the conversation. Um, the reminders of the of what you see of previous great powers that have come into Afghanistan, you, Alexander the Great, that's amazing, and the Soviets. And then we've been here ten years, um, and and now some of our own guys are getting hit by our allies. I mean, that must have, you know, I'm sure, all of this must have come up in conversation, and you know. What are the soldiers saying? How are they processing this um, when they're thinking about, I mean, you know, what we're doing here in Afghanistan? Yeah, uh, you know, from from a soldier standpoint, you know, a lot of our conversations were really just trying to prepare ourselves if it ever happened to us. Um, you know, making sure that regardless of, of where we went, um, whether it was on on base or or during patrols, um, positioning ourselves where we would have the tactical advantage of, over our Afghan counterparts if we had to, um, you know. So when when I would go out on on patrols and we'd have our Afghan counterparts with us, we would have troops up front, and then we would have troops U.S. troops uh, behind, and all of our Afghan counterparts would kind of be. Uh, in between two groups of, of U.S. troops. Um, 
So we, you know, we'd always just try to make sure that we were in a position of superiority if we needed to be, or we could quickly transition to that if we needed to. Um, so we're talking and, about being prepared for operations against the enemy, you know, but mm -hmm. also potentially if we get into a situation where, you know, the guys we're with actually turn on us, then what do we do? Yeah. I mean, th those were all things that we had to, had to think about and consider and, and, and have conversations about um, because that, you know, that wasn't, <clears throat> you know, that wasn't the, the only instance of that happening uh, in the, in the year I was there, there were a couple, a couple other incidents, uh, not necessarily where I was located, but, throughout the country where there were those insider attacks. I have in my mind the image of, you know, U.S. forces marching through Paris in 1944, mm -hmm. and the crowds are out to, you know, sing their praises and welcoming them and waving flags. And you're part of this operation to liberate these folks from, you know, the truly, truly oppressive force of the Taliban. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't seem to be the kind of reception you're getting there. No, not at all. Um, you know, I, I I was lucky enough to be in a position where where I was able to have some conversations with um, some village elders, um, as well as some of the provincial government, and. You know, a lot of the consensus of the Afghan people and, and even some of those in, in the Afghan government were, you know, they wanted us to, they wanted us to leave. They felt as though we had overstayed our welcome. Um, mm. You know, towards the beginning of it all, uh, most of the people and, and, and even some of those, you know, in, in government type positions, they were okay with us being there. They were okay with us hunting down Osama bin Laden because they understand the concept of, of retribution. They knew what he had done to our country and they were angry at him that he brought, that he essentially brought us to their country. And so they understood the concept of, of, of retribution. They, you know, they were okay with us being there hunting him down, but it's after, uh, after he, you know, fled the country um, and then especially after we found and killed him that they're like, okay, you guys came here to do what you, you wanted to do. Now you, it's time to go. It's time to leave. Wow. We want, we want Afghanistan back. It's ours. So what was your job then? We've sort of talked in general about your experience. What was your particular job? Uh, so I, I was a human int intelligence collector. Um, so most of my job um, was geared around um, conducting interrogations, um, strategic debriefings, uh, and then also uh, you know running essentially confidential informants for for uh, the government. Did you ever come across a situation where somebody just wanted to get somebody, and they thought the way I could get somebody is by going to the strategic debriefer and telling him a story about them and then they're gonna you know that's how i'll get at that person you know what i'm saying did, did you ever have to deal with anything oh, like that oh yeah absolutely um we had a situation there were uh there was a farmer who came up to the to the fob and you know said hey i, I want to talk to someone yeah. um so they called me up <clears throat> and i went down there to talk with them and and see what he knew what he what he wanted to talk about a lot of times when when folks would just come up to the to the gate of the fob and say hey i want to talk to somebody you know a lot of times those folks are just looking for you know a quick payment maybe a, a phone card that they can put on you know put minutes on their phone hmm. um, you know they're just looking to sell whatever little bits of information that they can um, but this gentleman, you know, he he said, you know, I've I've got the the name of a known terrorist. Uh, he's he works with the Taliban and he does this, that, and the other. Um, so I'm talking to him and I'm asking a lot of questions. You know, well, tell me about this. Tell me about this guy. What's you know, what's his name? What did he do? What happened? How do you know? Um, you know, just going through going through your kind of standard uh, questions. 
and something really wasn't quite sitting right. His body language was up. You know, he 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 didn't seem like somebody uh, who was worried that he lived right next door to a known Taliban uh, member, right? There, there's a general, if you're truly scared of somebody, your body's going to show that. Your face is mm-hmm. going to show that. Mm-hmm. And so I started to dig in more and ask some more pointed questions. And well, uh, what, what it ended up being is his neighbor ended up killing one of his goats and he wanted us to go and pick him up because you know and i'm like you you just you just need to go yeah you know and so so this is this is one of the challenges then when you're talking to these folks just first of all just trying to figure out whether they're on the level or not yeah oh absolutely yeah but no were you if the folks handed legit information to you then were they compensated somehow you said with a card or with a phone or something like that generally yeah um you know whether it was you know minutes for their phone or uh a lot of times we would just give them food for their families um we we, we did our best to not give cash right because that could always go to all sorts of different sure. yeah. uh, things um but but they were generally compensated in some way if it was you know minutes for their phone um uh, you know a couple bags of rice or uh, other food products, things like that. So, did um, did the information they gave did it have to check out before they were compensated? Uh, no, not not always. Um, we did a pretty good job. You know, luckily the the folks that I was there with, um, we did a pretty good job keeping up with each other. The different intelligence groups, you know, your signals intelligence, your analysts. We did a pretty good job of keeping each other in the loop. Uh, to know what trends were going on in the area um, so that we could at least on a very base level try to gain some sort of uh, veracity, right? Uh, To know if it was something that could potentially be true or if it was just something way out of left field that just made no sense with the area uh, or the specific groups that we were were working with there, Mm -hmm. so... Um, are you able to share um, something that's particularly memorable from an interrogation, either something that happened during an interrogation or something that happened as a result of? And I'm sure there's some things that you can't share because they're classified, but are there things you can share? Is there is there something that comes to mind? Um, you know, I think one of the most memorable experiences that I had didn't necessarily lead to any, you know, earth shattering intelligence or, or anything like that. Um, but the one interrogation that I'll always remember is uh, I had the opportunity to interrogate um, an old Mujahideen member. Mm-hmm. Um, and the stories that he had about fighting the Russians back in the eighties um, and what the world was like back then. Um, was just incredible. He had, uh, you know, part of the reason that that he had um, gotten detained is because he had um, several weapons in his home, uh, the amount that could be considered, you know, for uh, facilitating, you know, groups. Sure. Um, but, and so when they, you know, when they went in there, checked out his house, they also found a bunch of pictures of him holding these weapons in large groups. Uh, but what they missed is that he was much younger in those photos. Oh, I see. Uh, and so all of that stuff was from his time with the Mujahideen. He was a, a you know, a Mujahideen commander. Oh. And the stories that he told about fighting the Russians and, and uh, you know, leaving home at a young age, it was just an incredible story that he shared. Um, oh. And yeah, just to hear him talk about the different photos and what he was doing. Oh yeah, this was, uh, you know, back when we were getting ready to assault a, a Russian stronghold, or uh, this was right after we had ambushed and and taken out an entire, you know, squad of of, of Russian fighters. Um, wow. And so, so you had just the, incredible. So the photos apparently a search had been done. The photos had been collected, and then you had the photos in front of you and. 
Yeah. So you're asking him, what is this photo? Yeah. I'm pointing out to you, first of all, I look a lot. <laughs> I look a lot younger in this photo than I do right now. So that's one thing. But then yeah. he's telling you stories about the war with the Soviets. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was it was pretty incredible. I can imagine. Um and but it so far as the situation at the moment it seems like though he was okay. Yeah. Um you know with any interrogation, after we conduct the interrogation, we take all of that information, you know, we put it into different reports and we send that up to our analysts, to our signals intelligence guys, our, our GON, you know, all of those folks to help us build a complete picture, right? No one intelligence group is commanding, you know, the, 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 the operation. Yeah. Right. All of the intelligence uh, groups come together, you know, to to complete that full picture. Um, and when I had sent all of his information up and, and everything else that, that we had talked about, all the reports, um, he came back and he wasn't, you know, a, a known connection to any group. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so ultimately we, you know, released him to point of capture. But um, just the stories he told were were incredible. How about on the debriefing side, the strategic debriefing, anything, is there a particular memory you have related to that, that sticks especially in your mind? You know, the, I always remember, because uh, strategic debriefing also works with, uh, you know, working with other intelligence groups um, to, to collect information. So, for instance, I did a lot of work with, um, uh, the NDS or National Defense Service, which was kind of like the Afghan version of, it was like the Afghans intelligence service, right? Um, and so I did a lot of work uh, with them in terms of debriefing their uh, their folks and and doing what we could to, you know, share intelligence. But obviously, both sides are keeping things pretty close to the vest. Obviously, we don't want to yeah. overshare. Right. Um, but just talking with them about how they would conduct uh, intelligence operations, um, you know, obviously they weren't or they didn't follow as strict protocol as as the U.S. did. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that, that we always talked about or one of the things we we would always try and impart on them is that, you know, building a rapport with somebody is more powerful than demanding compliance or demanding answers, right? Because mm -hmm. if, if, if you're being interrogated and, and somebody's, you know, threatening you or, or, or getting physical with you, mm -hmm. you're going to tell them whatever they want mm -hmm. in order to get that to stop. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but if you're able to take the time and, and, and build that rapport with them, and get them to tell their their side of things from from a, a commitment standpoint rather than a, a demanding compliance. Generally, that in information or that intelligence is going to be much more reliable. And so we would always have those kind of of conversations when we would when we would be uh, sharing debriefings with each other or talking about different aspects of of how we collected intelligence. You've shared some of the um, the hard stories that you know we read about here in the states. The I think what were they called the blue on green attack. Mm -hmm. I think the Afghan soldiers turning on the Americans, and of course we hear those stories here in the states. Um, were there some Afghans you worked with in whom you had complete confidence, um, folks who who you know you really felt like you could work together in a in a spirit of trust, high trust. It, yeah, um, there, there were, there were a couple of groups. You know, uh, the folks that I worked with um, at that compound in in Zabul. Um, you know, a lot of them I would consider very high trust individuals. Um, the way that they responded as soon as those calls came in for the blue on green attacks, um, we had. Um, you know, one of the commanders of the uh, ANP or the, the Afghan National Police, that as soon as that call came in, 
he grabbed his three best guys, jumped into one of their trucks, and went to hunt them down. And he was on the radio with us the whole time. Hey, I've got them. They're, you know, here. They're moving here. And he was trying to coordinate as many folks as he could to get out there and catch these uh, these folks that, that, that killed U.S. troops. Um, and so that gesture really made me trust him um, in a way that that I probably didn't trust a whole lot of my counterparts. But just the way he jumped into action and the conviction in, in, in his voice and his body language, you know, really told me that that he was he was here to, to try and create something hmm. bigger and better. Interesting. Um, so he was definitely one of them. Um, and then there was another group that I worked with when I moved uh, down south to Kandahar province, a little fob called Masamgar. Um they were part of uh, what's called the, I believe they called it the legacy team. And so essentially they were the Afghan National Army's uh, human intelligence group or human group. Um, and I worked with them quite a bit. Um, and they were they were a really solid group of guys. Um, they, uh, you know, again, I think there was that, a little bit of that lack of, nation building or, or, or nationalism, you know, but you could tell that they were trying to create something better for Kandahar province, right? They all were born and raised there. They were trying to create something better for their family. You said a little while back that you, um, you know, that you had experience with um, IDs and you mentioned just the creativity of, you know, yeah pretty root with pretty rudimentary material um mm -hmm. these folks were able to make ids um was your experience with ids did was that just in the form of an intelligence guy who's you know looking at these and studying these or i mean did you actually experience them out in the field um as they were as they had been planted out there uh yeah um both actually um so from, you know, an intelligence standpoint, you know, I did what I could to understand how they were, you know, being built so that, um, you know, when I would go into an interrogation with somebody who was a suspected, you know, bomb maker or facilitator, that I could speak intelligently on that, you know, on, on their level. Um, but I also experienced a couple in the field. Um, for a while there, they, they had asked me to help out. Um, our engineer team, you know, the route clearance group. Um, and this was down in uh, Kandahar province, Panjway district. Um, we were actually out on uh, route new Charlottetown, which was historically always uh, what we called black, right? You had different levels uh, for how dangerous the route was. And if a route is black, then that means that there are there has been known activity in that area. And there's a very, very high probability of an explosive being planted somewhere along that route. Um, and so route New Charlottetown was was one of those that was historically uh, always considered uh, black. Um, and so we were, you know, we were out there. Um, we started to pick up some uh, chatter on our radios from uh, Taliban forces or, or um, insurgent organizations. It was probably the better way to explain that. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we had started to pick up radio chatter and we, we knew that they were planning some sort of ambush further up the road. Um, so we, we had the opportunity to call in um, and get, you know, air support on station, um, let them know that we were picking up these transmissions and stuff. Um, and so we're, we're continuing to, to clear the route. They had asked me to come with them to talk to folks on the route, essentially strategically debrief people as they were clearing the route to see if I could get information on anything that might have been ahead of us. 
have you seen anybody, you know, putting bombs in the road or or things like that? So they have uh, they have these trucks almost like a uh, like an excavator, right? Like a, a, like a caterpillar ex- excavator, but instead of having uh, you know the 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 arm on the front and the the bucket, it had a huge plate. Um, just a huge plate that they could, you know, raise or lower, and they were X-raying the ground as they would drive in front of. Them. See. Wow! Okay. Uh, and it would constantly feed that, you know, that uh, that image to them in the in the cab. Um, but they, you know, obviously those were very expensive machines, and if something was wrong or went down with it, um, you know, they do it the old school way. You know, just uh, metal detectors uh, walk in the route, um, and wow. and you know, check in as they go. Um, or sometimes they would have uh, some folks kind of supplementing uh, the husky with the uh, the hand uh, minesweepers or or uh, metal detectors. So we started to get this chatter um, over the radio, uh, you know, and and I was having my my interpreter, you know, tell me what they're talking about, what's going on, and you know, obviously they're using a lot of code words, but that's when the signals intelligence guys kind of help us out and uh, they can help clarify what some of those code words are typically used for and, and in what context. Um, but essentially, you know, they were planning some sort of, of ambush up ahead. Um, and so we were able to disrupt that. We were able to, to disrupt the ambush, uh, but they, you know, they still attacked, they still fired. Um, it was about, uh, so again, we were on route new Charlottetown, um, and it was about maybe three to 400 uh, meters off in the distance, a large compound. Uh, we had about 10 or 12, um, uh, insurgents start to open fire on us. Um, so, you know, we returned fire and, and we were, uh, it was a pretty intense situation because we, we not only had the, the 10 or 12, um, insurgents firing at us, but they were also, uh, they also had mortar rounds. Um, so we were, you know, we were returning fire and next thing we know, uh, a mortar round came down about maybe 40, 50 meters behind us. Um, then shortly after that, another one came down about 30 to 40 meters in front of us. And so they had us bracketed in, you know, if you're familiar with artillery fire, they, you know, they bracket you in, they'll hit behind you, then in front of you and just kind of walk it in. Yeah. Uh, so that next one likely could have come down right on top of us. Um, but luckily, uh, at that point, um, the uh, the air support that was on station showed up and started to do some strafing runs on uh, the compound. Um, and ultimately, one of the uh, one of the guys with us, he had the grenade launcher attachment for the M4. Um, he was able to get around out there and take out the uh, the mortar position. So after you know after we took out the the mortar position, we all felt you know it was it was a pretty big sigh of relief, right? I mean, mm-hmm. when it comes to uh, you know old sixties or seventies uh, Russian AK forty sevens versus you know brand new M four, generally the M four is 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 going to be the superior firepower. Mm-hmm. Um, but we also had, you know, by that time, our, our the rest of the trucks had pulled up um, and were taking a, a defensive position. So we were able to get, um, you know, the turrets thrown down range, you know, the, the 249s, the, the 50 cals. Um, so we were able to, you know, eventually, through superior firepower, uh, overwhelm and, and uh, you know, everybody went home that day. Um, but it was actually on the way back right after that. <laughs> so after that we're like okay you know we've cleared a good section of this route a lot of us because we were pinned down for a good i'd say hour hour and a half um in a in a pretty consistent firefight with these folks um so a lot of people were getting low on ammo you know we were um it, it was time to head back right uh and it was on the way back is when we hit uh the ied it was 
if I remember correctly, I believe it, they said it was like a 40, 45 pound IED. So uh, mid-sized IED. Um, and it hit just in front of the truck that I was in. So I was in one of, uh, they call them a, a Buffalo. So it's a big, uh, you know, kind of crew sized uh, uh, vehicle where, you know, it could fit, you know, about four to six folks in the back and then two up front. Um, but it also had some attachments on there that were specific for uh, engineers for route clearance and things like that. So it had a long, uh, long arm that could be manipulated to uh, check things out if there were any signs of, of IEDs or anything like that. Uh, but this was a remote controlled IED. So somebody off wherever, uh, you know, there, there was a cell phone that was attached to the actual IED. And whenever they called the the phone number associated with that phone, it would detonate. Wow. Uh, but lucky for us, whoever detonated it, their timing was off. So instead of being a direct hit on the truck I was in, it hit just in front of the truck that I was in. So luckily, uh, nobody got hurt. Um, the truck, other than a, a you know a couple of pieces of, of a uh, rock getting flung up and dinging it. There really wasn't any damage to the truck either, because um, they're all built, you know, pretty sturdy. Uh, yeah. But that was that was probably my closest call with an IED. Um, and then right after the IED went off, uh, it was it was it was a more complex ambush. We started to get uh, small arms fire and also yeah. RPG fire. Um, so we just broke contact and just hauled right back to to the fob. When your year in Afghanistan is up, um, what was your state of mind? Um, I mean, I, I'm, you know, probably eager to, you know, be back home. But yeah. if, you know, if we can, if we can put you on that plane while you're still on the ground in Afghanistan, um, you know, and just create a scenario where you're just sitting there and you've got time and you're, you're reflecting back on the previous 12 months. Um, what is your state of mind when you're leaving Afghanistan in 2012? Um, you know, honestly, relief. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 it almost feels like you can finally relax for the first time in a year. Um, because even when you're on your two week, you know, R and R that you would get during your your uh, deployment, <clears throat> you know that you're going back. You know that you're going back. So, yes, you can relax a little bit, but but truly, you can't really let yourself relax too much mm. because the last thing you want to do in those types of situations is become complacent, right? Uh, you 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 don't want to let your guard down because that's when mistakes get made that's when we don't ask the right questions that's when we don't look uh for those things that we need to look for to make sure that we're not going to hit an ied or walk into an ambush um and so leaving afghanistan i think what was going through my mind was okay i can finally relax 